DNA's podcast series, Let's Talk About Kidneys, provides education dedicated to exploring the journey of those living with chronic kidney disease. We're here to inspire meaningful conversations and to help people living with CKD gain a better understanding of their disease. Today's Let's Talk About Kidneys podcast topic is, what is new in kidney transplant? When choosing a treatment for end-stage renal disease, also known as ESRD, kidney transplantation is the option for some patients. Let's learn more about what is new in kidney transplantation. Welcome to the Let's Talk About Kidneys podcast, Dr. Saeem. How are you today? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. We are so happy to have you. So, Dr. Saeem joined DNA in 2014. He is a transplant nephrologist that sees patients at our Medical City Dallas Transplant Center. You ready to get started? Yes. All right. So let's get started with the basics. Tell us briefly about the history of kidney transplant. So the first kidney transplant was in 1954 in Boston. It was a living related kidney transplant. Interestingly, it was among identical twins. So the recipient did not have to take any anti-rejection medicines. Kidney transplant has come a long way since then. Last year, we performed more than 25,000 transplants in this country. Out of them, close to 7,000 were living donors. We still have a challenge to transplant more people as the number of patients on our transplant waiting list in the country is close to 100,000. Can you tell us what are the benefits of a kidney transplant? So kidney transplant in this day and age is the treatment of choice for most of the people with end-stage kidney disease. It improves their survival. It can improve their quality of life. They will have the ability to exercise, to travel, to work, and live as near normal life as possible. Right. And now let's talk about the risk of having a kidney transplant. So... There is surgical risk associated with the transplant surgery and the recovery period after the surgery. The anti-rejection medicines has some side effects also. And because these patients are immunosuppressed and have a weak immune system, they have a little higher risk of infection as compared to general population. So let's talk about the different types of kidney donors. So there is living kidney donors and there is disease donor kidney transplants. We can start with the living donor first. So living kidney donor transplant is the best option for anyone with who is pursuing a transplant. I always tell my patients that this is the best option for them. The kidney will last longer, so they'll have a better survival than disease donor kidneys. Can you talk to us about the living donor benefits? So I always tell my patients that living kidney transplant is the best option. Multiple reasons. The waiting time on the list is going to be short. The survival with the living kidney transplant is much better than a disease donor transplant. Patients who are not on dialysis, they also have the option to receive a preemptive transplant if they have a living donor, and that improves their long-term survival even more. Okay. And then who can be a kidney donor? So generally speaking, anybody who doesn't have high blood pressure or diabetes or is not overweight can be a living donor. They can fill the application and after doing the initial screening, reviewing the application, doing some labs, then we invite them to the transplant center and we evaluate them further. Okay. And so for those that are listening, who would not be ideal to donate? So anybody who is not overweight or has diabetes or high blood pressure, they cannot be a donor. Okay. Does the donor need to be related to the recipient? That's, I can, I can, I want to, I do want to share that um, I have had not one, not two, but three kidney transplants. And so um, my mother was my first donor. My husband was my second donor and my brother, one of my brothers was my third donor. So Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. So give us more details on how that all works. Yeah, no, you have been very fortunate. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, But that's a great question. And I tell my patients that in this day and age, with the modern anti-rejection medicines we have, living unrelated kidney transplant 
has almost the same survival as living related kidney transplant. So yes, they don't need to be related to the recipient. Perfect. And if someone is a living donor who is not a match for someone that they know that needs a kidney, who would be an option for them? So we have this thing, paired exchange program, where if you have a donor who is not a match, you can still utilize that donor. For example, let's say we have two pairs of donor and recipient, pair A and pair B. So pair A donor can donate to the recipient of pair B and the recipient for pair B can, uh, and the donor for pair B can donate to the recipient for pair A. This is the most simple form of paired exchange and we can have more pairs and follow the same concept. Mm -hmm. What is the waiting time on the transplant list? And is that waiting time going to be the same for everyone? So the waiting time on the transplant waiting list could be anywhere from three to seven years. Wow. Yes, the, like, like I said before, that we, the number of patients on the waiting list is uh, increasing and we don't have enough organs. So the waiting time on the list is also increasing with time. It's not the same for everybody. Blood group O has the longest waiting time and blood group AB has the shortest waiting time. Okay. Another option for kidney transplant is for a patient to receive a deceased donor. Can you talk about that process? Yes. So back in the days, we used to divide them into standard criteria donors and expanded criteria donors. An example of a standard criteria donor would be a 35-year-old healthy person who had no history of high blood pressure or diabetes and died in a motor vehicle accident. Example of an expanded criteria donor would be a 55-year-old person who had high blood pressure and died of a stroke. Expanded criteria kidneys were not as good as a standard criteria kidneys, but they could still go up to six years or more. Now we have changed it into KDPI kidneys. Can you explain the definition of KDPI? Yeah, KDPI stands for Kidney Donor Profile Index. Okay, Kidney Donor Profile Index. All right. Some of the factors that come into this are the age of the donor, if the donor had high blood pressure, or if they have kidney disease. Generally speaking, lower kidney KDPI kidneys last longer as compared to high KDPI kidneys. We just talked about the high KDPI kidneys. So who as a patient would benefit from receiving a high KDPI kidney? So any diabetic above the age of 50 or anybody else above the age of 60 can benefit from these kidneys. Okay. For example, if there is a 55-year-old diabetic who's on dialysis, they should definitely consider this kidney because we know that diabetics have a higher mortality on dialysis. And the sooner they get a transplant, the better it is for them. And these high KDPI kidneys can still go up to six years. Are there options for other diseased donor kidneys for patients? Yes, so another Option is taking kidneys from hepatitis C positive donor. So for example, a patient who is on dialysis can consider a kidney from a hepatitis C positive donor and we can use that kidney, transplant the patient, and then we have a whole protocol where we check this recipient for hepatitis C. And as soon as they convert and we see the evidence of the virus in the blood, we can start them on a medicine for three months and it can clear the virus. Now we're going to talk about kidneys that can come from small children. There's research done out there. There's transplants that have been done. So can you kind of elaborate on that for us? Yeah, so that's another option in diseased donor kidneys that we could take kidneys from small children, babies who pass away and use them in a certain kind of recipient based on their blood pressure requirement and their weight. Tell us about the kidney transplant surgery and the surgical recovery. So generally, kidney transplant surgery is about two to three hours long. 
when we work up these patients before transplant, we make sure their cardiovascular status is good, means their heart is in good condition, so it can handle the stress of the surgery, stress of the anesthesia, blood loss, etc. After the surgery, they are in the hospital for four to five days, and then they are discharged home and they come to the transplant clinic. Okay. And do patients ever need dialysis after receiving a kidney transplant? Yes, sometimes patients can receive dialysis after transplant. It's more common in diseased donor kidneys. Okay. Some of these kidneys need a little time to work. And during that time, if the patient's toxins are high, they could need dialysis to clean their blood till the kidney starts working. How is the recovery from a kidney transplant? So... Generally speaking, it depends on the patient. If the patient is physically active and is exercising before the transplant, then they have a faster recovery after transplant. They are able to drive in three to four weeks after transplant. They can go back to work in four to eight weeks after transplant. Okay. And I, I would like to give um, just a personal perspective. So my first two transplant, well, I've been physically fit and active, you know, my whole life. But I did notice a difference in the recovery from having a transplant without dialysis and having a transplant coming off of dialysis. So I wasn't as active as I was. And I know that there's definitely a difference. So if there are patients out there that are on the waiting list that are getting a workup, just please do all that you can to be physically fit, eat healthy and stay active because it does help with your recovery. So. Definitely. So when patients are discharged from the hospital, like what do they expect? What should they expect? So when they're discharged, they come to the transplant clinic, initially two to three times a week. Then the visits get better. Every time they come, we go over their medicines, go over their blood pressure, their sugar, uh, look for any signs and symptoms of rejection, infection, etc. make changes in their medicines. They need somebody to bring them to the transplant clinic in the beginning as they cannot drive on their own. Sustaining the kidney, obviously you're gonna need medications. So how many medications do patients have to take after transplant? And if a patient is on a medic medication prior to having a transplant, will they still need to take those medications? So these are very important questions. Um, generally speaking, there are two or three anti-rejection medicines, which we also call immunosuppressive medicines they have to take after transplant. Then there are about two or three medicines they have to take for some period to prevent infections, which can happen after transplant. Patients can be on some blood pressure medicines, which, could, which might be the same as they were on before or might be different now. They might need diabetic medicines. If they have diabetes, they might need cholesterol medicines. Some of these medicines over time can be stopped based on the patient's condition. Can you dive a little bit more into the different types of anti-rejection drugs? So anti-rejection drugs, which we call immunosuppressive drugs, generally there are two or three of them, which patients have to take every day. They suppress the immune system of the patient to a level where the kidney can work and there's no rejection. They do have some side effects. Most of the time, the side effects are very well tolerable. If one patient cannot tolerate the side effect of some medicine, we can switch to some other medicine which they can tolerate. Okay. And are there any new immunosuppressive medications that have come about in the last decade? Yes, there's a medicine, Bilatacept also known as Neologix. It got approved in 2012. It's an infusion medicine and has been used in combination with other transplant medicines and it has shown improvement in the survival of the transplants. Are there any other options for diabetic patients with kidney disease? Yes, so there is another option which is a combined kidney pancreas transplant. Um, generally speaking, patients have to be healthier they have to be dependent on insulin and their weight has to be below a certain level to benefit from it. So an uh, example would be a 35-year-old type 1 diabetic who is on insulin as on dialysis. He applies and get this combined kidney pancreas transplant. So the advantages is 
The waiting time for this is much shorter than a kidney transplant alone. This person is able to get off insulin. They don't have diabetes. And because of this mere fact that they don't have diabetes, their kidney can last longer as compared to just a kidney transplant alone in the same individual. So the future of kidney transplant. So there are a um, few things on the horizon. One of them is artificial kidneys. And there's been work going on in this field. And basically, uh, one uh, type is a small dialysis machine, which a patient can connect to their belt or their vest and can do more frequent dialysis and can do dialysis whenever and wherever they want. Uh, the other thing that's been studied is uh, artificial kidney, uh, where they're working on making a filtration membrane and some cells that look like cells in the kidney. Uh, we need more experiments and more studies before um, it can uh, be implemented. The second option out there is the xeno transplant, which means transplant from an animal into a human. Uh, first successful uh, xeno transplant from a genetically edited pig to a human was performed this year in Boston, and it was successful. Uh, when I say genetically edited, I mean that that pig was in the lab and they worked on that kidney and removed some genes and made some additions to it so a human body can receive it and does receive it successfully. Do you have any messages for patients that are listening? It's going to be a variety of listeners. There could be people that are early stage kidney disease. There are people that could be on the waiting list, people preparing to be on the waiting list. What message do you have for our listeners? So kidney disease is a very silent disease. I always tell my patients, Try to be as active physically as you can. Try to exercise if possible. Control your weight. Control your blood pressure. Control your diabetes. Follow up closely with your nephrologist. Once their kidney function is less than 20% or they are on dialysis, they can apply for kidney transplant. We are so grateful for you to have joined us today. Um, your wealth of knowledge and transplantation and um, all of the new therapies, the new medications. I think it just shows how much um, the needle is moving forward in the research and the implementation of that research. So thank you so much, Dr. Saeed, for being our uh, podcast guest today. Thank you. And we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. For information about Dallas Nephrology Associates, please visit our website at dneph.com. If you found our information helpful, feel free to share it with others who may also be affected by chronic kidney disease. Dallas Nephrology Associates DNA podcast series, Let's Talk About Kidneys, is provided for general information purposes only and does not replace the need to talk with a healthcare professional about your unique situation, care, and options. Our goal is to provide you with as much information as possible so you can be as informed as possible. Reference to any specific product, service, entity, or organization does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by DNA. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity or organization they represent. The views and opinions expressed by DNA employees, contractors, or guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of DNA or any of its representatives. Some of the resources identified in the podcast are links to other websites. These other websites may have differing privacy policies from those of DNA. Please be aware that the internet sites available through these links and the material that you may find there are not under the control of DNA. DNA shall have no responsibility for the accuracy, legality, or content of the external site or subsequent links. Contact the external site for answers to questions regarding its content. The resources included or referenced in the podcast and on the website are provided simply as a service. DNA does not recommend, approve, or endorse any of the content on the linked sites. The content provided on this website and in the podcast is not medical advice and should not be used to evaluate, diagnose, treat, or correct any medical condition. The content is solely intended to educate users regarding chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, ESRD, end-stage kidney disease, ESKD, and related conditions, and ESRD, ESKD treatment options. None of the information provided on this website or referenced in the podcast is substitute for contacting a healthcare professional.